<laughs> for a change. Good evening. Welcome to the City of Sugarland City Council meeting for Tuesday, June the 7th. A little bit about the agenda tonight. In a minute, uh, William's going to take us through the invocation and the Pledge of Allegiance. That'll be followed by a special recognition. Uh, and then we'll be on to, uh, on to business. We have a, a special announcement tonight. It is Council Member Stuart Jacobson's birthday. And Stuart is, Stuart is very fond of his birthday. In fact, he had us sing happy birthday to him in, in the council dining room. So if you he could rise us. with me and sing happy birthday to Stuart Jacobson. Happy birthday to you. I refuse. Can I take Happy a knee? Happy birthday to you. I take a knee. Happy birthday, dear Stuart. Happy birthday I'm to on my you. Knee. <laughs> now, William, you can pray for Stuart. <laughs> Okay, folks, let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I come to you tonight to once again thank you for all that you do for us. Thank you for this beautiful city, for these beautiful members of our community, and for these kind and humble leaders. I ask for your wisdom as we consider decisions that will direct this wonderful city into the future. I pray for safety, respect, and opportunities for all members of our community. Even though life is not always easy, I pray that we find ways to make life enjoyable for all. In your son's name I pray, amen. Amen. I pledge, pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. I'd like to ask uh, Ruth Lomer, Ruth and Louis uh, Guajardo. Louis is a Houston section director of the Texas chapter of the American Planning Association. Louis, thanks for coming down. Good evening. You want to introduce the topic for us? Thank you, Mayor. Um, yes, so we are here tonight to talk about um, the designation of Sugarland Town Square Plaza as a great place in Texas. Um, I'd also like to invite Don Jansen and Wendy Lewis Buckley with Planned Community Developers. And I see Teresa Prezis. You can come up here too, because I know she used to be with the city and now she's with PCD and is involved in their event planning too. Um, so PCD was um, the original developer of Town Square and the Plaza, and they continue to be involved with its um, programming and maintenance and keeping it to be a great place. Um, so the city and PCD really share in the success of the Plaza. Um, Town Square Plaza was developed almost 20 years ago and has become a community focal point for Sugarland. Um, it's where people are gather for large events um, like the annual Christmas tree lighting, everyday events hosted by PCD such as movies under the moon and fitness classes, and also just those spon spontaneous moments with friends for coffee or watching their kids play soccer out on the turf. Um, it's become a place really for the community. And when I see people of all ages and stages of life enjoying the plaza, I'm reminded of the great work that planners and planning have done and continue to do in Sugarland. Um, seeing this come to fruition took a great deal of foresight and persistence on the part of both PCD and city leaders over many years. Um, and it's great places like Sugarland Town Square Plaza that enhance our community and make it a great place that people want to be. Um, so now I want to introduce Luis Guajardo. He is the, um, as the mayor said, the Houston section director of the Texas chapter of the American Planning Association, and he's going to present the recognition for us tonight. Thank you. Thank you very much. I, that round of applause is actually for everyone else in this room because you all have done this hard work. Uh, true really really well thought out planning takes time, effort, years. It takes uh, multi-sector collaboration between government and private sector and other entities involved. So 
really just a hats off to all of you. This is one of six great places in Texas within the Houston region. Uh, I think there's a big pride in that and we wanna just salute the community of Sugar Land and the city of Sugar Land for that accomplishment. Um, the Great Places in Texas program recognizes the very best in the Lone Star State. It recognizes neighborhoods, streets, and public spaces that celebrate how, and celebrate how planning has played a vital role in where we live and where we work and where we play. And I've experienced the town square myself. I brought my kids out before to some of the car shows. They love it. It, it just has this way of bringing you in and, and you feel very much at home. Um, the program really promotes and recognizes, again, those great places while celebrating the stories of exemplary planning that have resulted in stronger and healthier communities for all. And on behalf of the American Planning Association's Texas chapter, we want to salute you and congratulate you on that hard work. Um, just a little bit about APA Texas, in case if many of you are, we're not all planners, but we work in the, in the public realm here. Uh, APA Texas really exists to elevate and unite a diverse urban planning profession as it helps communities and their leaders and residents to anticipate and meet the needs of a changing world. The chapter and its members, through their knowledge and experience in planning, like Ruth and others, uh, help to shape communities and environments that are responsive to the needs and the problems of society and working closely with elected officials to make that reality happen. Just a little bit more that I wanna say before we uh, move on here and I have some more remarks. Um, and as a director of APA Houston, I represent over 500 members and it gives me great pride, again, as I mentioned, to see the hard work throughout this region and to be recognized for that hard work in what is conventionally known, Houston within the urban planning world, for those of you who are not in urban planning, typically it gets knacked for not being a conventional region where we do planning the, the typical way. Um, so again, it's just a, it's a moment of pride to see these different places and spaces playing out and getting the recognition they deserve. Sugarland Town Center, uh, Sugarland Town Square is one of six winners this year across three categories of great neighborhoods, great streets, and great public spaces, and only one of two winners uh, in the great public spaces category. You all are joining uh, a few others in Houston like Buffalo Bayou, Discovery Green, Herman Park, The Strand in Galveston, and Montrose. Uh, and so I just wanna make sure that you all uh, reflect on that and pat yourself on the back for, for some of this hard work. Um, and I'm gonna close out by just saying that um, really great public spaces, they're designed to support community quality of life. Um, a lot of that is happening here, the programming, the activities that occur, the life that is, on the, that, that is on the street. You just feel connected between this small space and the rest of the community. And so congratulations again for all the hard work and hopefully Sugarland can work on having a second great place in, <laughs> in Texas in future years.
We're going to now move on to the public comments section, which is reserved for anything that's not a public hearing. We have no public hearings tonight. Anybody that would like to comment on any of the agenda items is encouraged to come to the podium. Uh, state your name and your address, and you'll be given three minutes. Anybody? And we have no one signed up in advance, okay. Mr. Mayor. Second call. We're going to go ahead and move on. Move on to the consent agenda. Item number three is the consent agenda. All items on the consent agenda are going to be taken under one motion. Unless a council member pulls an item or items, then we'll take those uh, brief presentation on those items, Q&A. Uh, do I have a motion? So moved. Got a motion by Jacobson. Do I have a second? Second. Uh, second by Kermali, the international traveler. <laughs> You'll vote this time, please. Councilman Kermali has been around the world in the last month and a half. Uh, last, I mean, the last week. There we go. That's even better. Item number four, contracts and agreements. For a consideration of an action on authorization of amendment number one of the contract with Holland and Knight in the amount of $40,000 for an extension of federal lobbying services through September 30th of 2022. This particular extension brings the contract total amount to $85,000 we have with us tonight, Rick Ramirez, our Intergovernmental Relations Manager. Rick. Good evening, Mayor and City Council. Uh, tonight, I will be discussing with you the extension for federal lobbying services with Holland and Knight. Tonight, I'll be providing an introduction and some background for why the city uh, is in need of federal lobbying services. Also discuss Holland and Knight and the services that they provide. I'll go over the terms of agreement uh, for the extension for the contract. I'll also um, give you a recap of what came out of the May IG committee meeting, the Intergovernmental Relations Committee, and then I'll provide you with staff's recommendation. So currently the city manages local and regional and state legislative government relations. Uh, occasionally, we do get involved with federal government relations, but that's usually on a specific item that we've identified that the city needs to go out and, and do some federal advocacy. Um, however, with the passage of some large, very large uh, federal funding packages and with the reintroduction of community funding projects, you may know them as earmarks, uh, the city has seen a need to have a more robust federal advocacy program. Um, you also will uh, recognize that City Council has, in uh, uh, past retreats and meetings, has talked about strategic outcomes, especially in uh, financial strength and viability. And there is an all-in initiative for alternative funding sources, and this would help us to be able to uh, go after uh, federal dollars and grant opportunities. So Congress passed the Infrastructure and Investment Jobs Act. You might know that as a bipartisan infrastructure bill. That passed in November of last year. It was a historic $1.2 trillion investment in uh, the country's infrastructure. Uh, some of the provisions in the bill included um, uh, money for building roads, bridges, and rails, um, expanding access to clean drinking water, expanding high-speed internet, and some appropriations for climate, uh, climate and uh, environmental investments. Additionally, uh, we have the uh, second round in a, in a row now uh, for community funding, uh, project funding. And that's that con congressionally directed spending that benefits a specific state, locality, or congressional district. Now, the federal government in general can be complex in cities um, that are not equipped uh, to be able to navigate that process or at a disadvantage. Um, we need professionals uh, to help us uh, navigate the federal government and the federal uh, appropriations process. And so we need pros on our corner uh, who can help the city uh, navigate that process, who are professional communicators, and help ensure that our community's voice is heard in Washington, D.C. So in response to these uh, large federal funding packages, uh, the city staff contracted with Holland and Knight for federal lobbying services as a pilot program. Uh, we initially spoke with the IG committee 
back in January of this year. Um, we reviewed the contract uh, at that time with them, and we did a four and a half month um, uh, contract with Holland and Knight that started in January 14th of this year and ended May 31st of this year. Um, some of the things that uh, Holland and I has helped us with in the past four and a half months is they've helped us with profile raising with federal legislators and with visits to Washington, D.C. Uh, Mayor Zimmerman and I had visited with Senator Cruz and Senator Cornyn's office. We'd also visited with uh, uh, Congressman Nels's office uh, over there in Washington, D.C. Um, also with the development of a community project funding request that we submitted back in April. And uh, Holland and Knight has also provided staff with uh, workshops to better understand the Bipartisan Infrastructure uh, Act. Uh, and they also help are helping us right now uh, aid staff in aligning funding opportunities with current city projects. We'll go over some of the terms of the agreement. The, uh, the contract extension that y'all are um, considering today will extend the contract through September 30th of this year, that would be the, the end of the fiscal year, for an amount of $40,000. In addition to the $45,000 uh, contract that we had from January to May, the, that would bring the total contract for amount to $85,000 for FY22. Um, uh, council will also be discussing any future engagement um, at, at the budget discussions that y'all are going to be having this summer. Um, and with those, uh, with that contract, they will help us with the development of our federal agenda, uh, helping us develop a funding strategy, uh, help us with partnership and profile raising, uh, communication management, and any advocacy that we ask them to provide for us. I wanted to introduce you to the Holland Knight team. Um, also, I want to acknowledge that we have uh, Leslie Polner who's one of our co-leads for the contract, uh, who's um, on the line with us uh, via the internet right now. Um, we do have two co-leads. We have Leslie Polner and Lisa uh, Barkovic, uh, who are um, uh, the contract managers for this um, uh, contract. We also have a water policy expert in Lori Hedinger, and we have an aviation and transportation expert in uh, David Whitestone. Um, you also note, if you look at uh, the team there, that we have liaisons with both uh, uh, Republicans and Democrats uh, there in Congress, and that uh, helps us when we're trying to uh, increase our profile and go after specific funding. The IG committee met in May of this uh, year. Uh, they reviewed Holland and Knight's contract and recommended staff to extend the term of that contract uh, through the end of September. Uh, the committee asked us to bring the contract extension to City Council uh, at this meeting tonight. And so with that, staff's recommending that City Council extend the contract with Holland and Knight for federal lobbying services. Uh, and I and Leslie would be uh, ready to take any of your questions. Councilmember, any question? Councilmember Got a motion by McCutcheon. Do I have a second? Got a second by Jacobson. Vote at this time, please. And it passed 7 0. Thank you, Council Members. Thank you. Thank you, Rick. Thank you, Leslie. Item number five, ordinances and resolutions. First consideration, consideration of and action on City of Sugarland Ordinance number 2264, an ordinance of the City Council of the City of Sugarland, Texas, amending the Code of Ordinances by revising Chapter 2, Article 3, Boards and Commissions, revising Chapter 3, Article 2, Animal Services, revising Chapter 4, Article 4, Peddlers and Solicitors, deleting Chapter 4, Article 6, Vehicles for Hire, revising Chapter 5, Article 3, Use of public right of way, Chapter 5, Article 4, Traffic, repealing all ordinances or parts of ordinances in conflict herewith, and providing an effective date. Our attorney, Meredith Reedy. Meredith? Yes, sir. Thank you for reading all that. So, um, we had a workshop back in March 
going over some of the updates and I told you I'd be bringing back an ordinance, it's phase one. These are the three things that we are covering that you read in that extremely lengthy uh, caption. It's the housekeeping items, revisions to peddlers and solicitors to come in line with Supreme Court cases. And we're gonna update some speed zones. So um, you may recall at your fall workshop, you asked us to do some ho housekeeping and some cleanup. So we have started that process. And as we go through it, we realize there's a lot more than uh, we had thought at the time we agreed to it. So this is gonna be a multiple phase type deal. But I start off nice and easy. So chapter two, we're revising the PNZ terms so that the ordinance actually matches the charter. The charter says two years, ordinance says one. They're now gonna match if you pass this evening. Ethics Review Board, we had a typo. So we fixed that formatting error. Chapter three, definition of running at large. We've clarified that to make it a little bit easier to prosecute cases and it doesn't have to necessarily be on private property. If the dog is running down a sidewalk or a street, it's also now running at large. We went ahead and deleted chapter four, vehicles for hire, because it turns out we have not issued a taxi cab license since May of 2019. Seems kind of pointless to waste a tree and have a couple of pages for something we never use. Chapter five, we have some exceptions to the right away permits. Uh, that's actually not how we do business. So we took those exceptions out. So if you are under a contract with the city, you still go through the process. You may have a different fee, but you still go through the process and we still review your permit. Uh, we've updated some street name changes such as oil filled road is now known as scenic rivers. We didn't catch that last time. And we added a couple of streets from when we annexed new territory in Greatwood. So substantive changes, peddlers and solicitors, these are the guys and girls that go knocking door to door, um, interrupt your dinner and wanna sell you solar security or that sort of thing. State law says we have to, state and federal law says we have to allow them. We can put some rules and regulations on them. So we've updated our definitions. We previously had canvas and solicit. We now have commercial and non-commercial. This is in align with US Supreme Court cases. And so we've changed the hours from 9 a.m. to 8 p.m to 8 a.m. to 30 minutes after sunset, recognizing that during the winter, 8 p.m. is dark and you really don't want to open your door after hours when it's dark outside. And so we do still require them to do a background check to the city secretary's office, excuse me, I'm sorry, the permitting office and go through all that and receive a badge. When we do that, we also post and give them a copy of a no solicitation registry. So if you go online to the city's website, you can put your name and address in there and say, I'm not interested in being solicited we do provide them with a copy of that and post it on the website. And so um, we're also putting in there a specific language that says we are exempt from requiring a license. You still have to get a badge um, if it's allowed by law. So we cannot regulate um, non-commercial solicitations. If you're going door to door saying vote for my candidate or this is my, the name of my God, I'd like to talk to you about my religious beliefs um, and that sort of thing, canvassing, you're allowed to do that. You still get a badge, but we don't require you to go through the background check. And also if you wanna sell alarm systems, apparently they have a very good lobbyist and state law says that you don't have to have a registration from the city to sell alarms door to door. Don't understand it, but I'm local, not state. Uh, we also added language that said the city will issue a permit within five days if the person meets the background check. We didn't have a time frame before. It seems reasonable to say, hey, this is when you can come back and expect it. Uh, we also had a time period for denial or revocation where the city manager had to hear the appeal within 24 hours, recognizing that one time we got one on a Friday afternoon and the city manager was not happy with me when I said you've got until tomorrow morning to make a decision. We're now changing that to three business days. It was not the city manager. So substantive changes on speed zones. As mentioned back in March, we had hired a company called the Alliance Transportation Group to conduct some speed zones. They looked at 28 different segments in the city. I believe that either Rob or Brian can explain what I don't understand, but we are going through a process where they're updating and, and checking the speed limits to make sure they're still accurate because over time, driving habits have changed, road conditions have changed, and they're gonna go through periodically and you've approved contracts for that. So in this first round, they looked at 28 segments and only seven segments um, recommended changes. I know my maps are very hard to see, but in your agenda packet, I put full page so you can actually follow along with me this time. So we'll use a trace. As you can see, it goes from, um, all the way from Austin Parkway to 59. What they're doing is they're changing it to make it one consistent speed limit of 35 miles per hour for that entire stretch. Meadowcroft, making changes to make it one consistent speed of 40 miles per hour from First Colony Boulevard to University Boulevard. Alston Road, 
uh, they actually shortened the distance. And so the 30 mile per hour speed limit actually is now meeting the boundaries of the um, school zone. So from Barrington Place school zone, it'll all match from something Crescent, I forgot the name of that one. From Magnolia the Crescent to Derry Ashford Road, the distance of 0 0.401 miles will actually be 35 miles per hour. So they've changed it so that the school zone start to finish is the same speed limit. Uh, I will point out that I made a typo in your ordinance. And so the ordinance says it's a distance of 0.587. It's actually a distance of 0 0.401. Lexington Boulevard, we're gonna continue with our process. And so it's gonna be a continuous speed limit now from Lexington Boulevard from Dulles Avenue all the way down to Sweetwater Boulevard. Dulles Avenue, um, Lexington Boulevard to Highway 6 is now gonna be 35. And Industrial Boulevard will have 40 miles speed limit uh, from Jess Pirtle to US 90A. New Territory, 35 miles per hour from New Territory Boulevard all the way down uh, Westcott to the city limits. And those are the seven seg segments we recommended changes. And the purpose of those is just so that you don't have one odd speed limit in the, in the middle of a longer speed zone so that it's one consistent speed. I went through all those fairly quickly. So um, if you have any questions, we are happy to take them. Well, in the shot. Meredith, can you go back to Alston Boulevard, if you don't mind? I'd be happy to. And maybe I misunderstood you, but does Alston stay consistent at 30 miles an hour all the way through? Or did I hear you say that it goes 30, then 35 on Alston as well? I'm calling in a friend, quoting a friend. Sorry. Brian Butcher, our director of public Good evening, Art. Brian Butcher, public Art director. Yeah. So the, the specific change that's happening tonight is <coughs> Um, from Barrington Place Elementary, 200 and 220 feet east of Magnolia Crest. So it's just that run in there. Um, whether or not there's a spot in Alston that goes back up to 35, it actually does beyond that a little ways. Yeah, I'm just thinking as a driver, where am I 30? Where am I 35? I'm on the same road. Sure. I'm, I'm and, and that, a little and confused. That let me put this down. That that. That happens regularly throughout the city, and, and a lot goes into these, right? We look at uh, current flow of traffic, spacing between driveways. We look at uh, uh, the geometry, meaning the width of the lanes, as well as the, the direction of flow. So a lot goes into this, and, and from time to time, roadways will change between 30, 35, 40 to 35, things like that. So, cur so currently that spot is 35? Correct. And it's going down to 30? Yes. Yes, sir. Okay, no further questions. Carol? Um, yes, I believe that phone solicitation starts at nine o'clock in the morning through some federal law, but I know when we, we had nine o'clock and this was proposing to allow uh, solicitors to be knocking at your door at 8 a.m. So I was just um, curious what was the uh, thought process behind someone getting to knock at your door at eight o'clock in the morning. I would defer that to the Supreme Court justices that are sitting up in Washington, D.C. <laughs> it was their determination that we needed to expand the hours, not us personally, but when uh, multiple cases have gone through it and challenged various pillars and solicitors laws, and that was one of them, because by saying 9 a.m., you've already gotten everybody off to school, you've gotten off to work, and you've limited their opportunity to actually reach a resident, mm -hmm. and, which is why you have to have the before and the after. Thank you. Jennifer. On the uh, badges yes. that you're to obtain yes. in order to go door to door, how does that affect um, scouts and kids selling for fundraising for schools and things like that? Um, well, technically under the ordinance, they would be required to get a permit, but this is enforced on a complaint basis. So unless someone is unhappy about getting a Girl Scout cookie or receiving fertilizer, we don't usually get complaints, and so there is no enforcement to go out there and require them. Um, and if there is a complaint, the officers go out there and say, hey, I'm Officer so-and-so, thank you for being in the city of Sugarland. What are you doing today? Oh, I'm, so, I'm selling Girl Scout cookies. Okay, well, we have this ordinance, and I'd recommend you know, you do this sort of thing. But in all the years I've been here, 
we have never had anybody complain about the Girl Scouts or the Boy Scouts. Follow up. And how much is uh, is it to purchase? Do you have to purchase the badge, or you just have to fill out a form to get authorized to get issued a badge? How does that work? You know, I don't recall. I would be. Happy we don't to stump you very often. So I, uh, I, was I, I don't have the fee ordinance up pulled up right now. Uh, I know that we require them to provide a background check and then we double check the background check by going through PD and asking for any questions that we don't understand the charges. I, I will get back to you and put on second reading if there is in fact a fee. Yes, ma'am. Stuart. Thank you, Mayor. Meredith, could we please, it went very quickly, could we please see Lexington and then Dulles? Okay. All right, and then Dulles, please. Got it. Okay, thanks. And when in doubt, you can go 35 miles per hour. That's the default speed zone. Thank you very much. William. Okay, I'm going to revisit where Jennifer was. So yes. as a police officer, I can't imagine having to go to a call on scouts selling cookies, for example. Is this something that is can be reconsidered or are we are we leaning to requiring these young people to come to city hall or permits to get this tag so that our officers at some point maybe only once has to make that stop well one of the changes we're making is that we used to have an exemption that you do not need a permit if you're a 14 or under and the U.S. Supreme Court said, well, that's great, but, you know, you could have a 12-year-old who's out there selling vacuums, not just the Girl Scout cookies or the fertilizer or the, the coupons or whatever the Boy Scouts talk me into buying every time they ring my doorbell because they look so cute and adorable. Um, and so we can't do that based on their age. And then they said you cannot have the Girl Scout Boy Scout exception. You've got to regulate either you're selling or you're not selling, and you cannot draw the line. Um, Fortunately, a lot of people in our, our neighborhoods are not too unhappy about them, but you also have the opportunity because they, they'll get you outside the grocery store, Home Depot, and Lowe's, and that seems to be the model that mm -hmm. they're going towards these days. I have yet to find a girl willing to knock on my door and sell me the cookies. I have to get her an HEB. If I may follow yes, up. Well, so as it is today, prior to this update, uh, as it is today, these young people could come to the door I'll probably buy because it's Stuart's birthday. But um, these young people could come to the door and they're not required to have a badge. Is that correct? Um, until, unless and until you pass this on second reading, as of, as of that point in as time, a, if you're 14 and under, you do not need to have a badge under our ordinance. And there's not a current uh, background check for someone selling cookies or something? No, I, I don't know. No, sir. Okay. Just checking. Okay, thank you. Anyone else? Do we have a motion? Make a motion to approve. Kermali's got the motion. Uh, do we have a second? Yeah. Is that Suzanne? Yeah. Okay, Ms. Watley, second. Uh, if you'll vote at this time. And it passes six to one. Well, you were going to argue with the Supreme Court. <laughs> Item number 5B, first consideration. Consideration of an action on City of Sugarland Ordinance number 2266, an ordinance of City Council of the City of Sugarland, Texas, amending Chapter 2 of the Code of Ordinances to provide for an increase in the tax exemption on a resident's homestead and establishing an effective date. We have with us tonight Ms. Jennifer May, our Deputy City Manager. Jennifer. Good evening, Mayor and City Council. As you will recall and Rick referenced earlier, you outlined recently eight strategic outcome areas, setting a bold vision for the city over the next several years at a recent planning session. One of those outcome areas is finance being strong and viable with us being a leader in financial management and providing our taxpayers with exceptional value. As such, I'm really proud of the city's long history of financial stewardship whether that is us having one of the lowest tax rates in the state of Texas among cities our size, 
or our intentional and increasing investment in the high quality of services that matter so much to our residents. We also, of course, believe that stewardship and resiliency are closely related and knowing that there is absolutely no shortage of challenges or opportunities before us, we are continuing to strategically use each of the financial tools that we have in our toolbox to help mitigate the tax impacts to residents while also continuing to invest in amenities and services that are important to them. This year, we know that the 2022 preliminary tax roll from the appraisal district has shown substantial growth and assessed value beyond what we have seen in recent history. And so we have begun looking at the use of the homestead exemption to help manage residential tax bills and the impact of these rising property values to homeowners, recognizing that for each 1% increase in the homestead exemption, taxpayers in total will see about $400,000 in savings. While our financial management policy statements anticipate recommending adjustments to the homestead exemption after we receive certified tax rolls in subsequent tax years, we believe that the significant growth that we're seeing this year calls for making that adjustment sooner, even before receiving this year's certified tax roll. And so with that, staff recommended at your budget retreat last month to do a 1% increase in the homestead exemption in order to provide tangible benefit to homeowners. And this is consistent not only with our goal of minimizing residential tax bills, but it is also consistent with our history of periodic but regular increases to this exemption over the past decade plus. Logistically, the new exemption would be will be effective um, upon your approval for the 2022 tax bill, which will be finalized after the City Council approves the budget and tax rate this September after a series of public hearings. And with that, at this time, I'm happy to recommend approval of ordinance number 2266, amending the residential homestead for property taxes for the year beginning January 1st, 2022, up to 13%. The second reading will occur at your next city council meeting to um, make sure that we meet the statutory deadline of the end of this month to make that change. And with that, I'd be happy to take any questions you have. Thank you, Jennifer. Questions? Motion to Got a motion to approve from McCutcheon. Do I have a second? Second. Got a second by Lane. You know, this is pretty consistent, I think, with what we've always strived to do, which is to make sure that if we have uh, a period of, of extraordinary value, the assessed value, uh, even recognizing that the state has limited what we actually receive to 3.5% of, of, of revenue. But uh, this is a responsible way to give our homeowners a little bit of a breather from a, from a tax rate without reducing our overall tax rate. So we've got a motion, we've got a second. If a we'll vote at this time, please. And it passes seven zero. Thank you, Jennifer. Thank you. Item number six, City Council City Manager Report Seven A. Council Member Reports. William, we're going to go to you first. <laughs> One night that I'm very glad I got to go first. Today is Stuart's birthday. <laughs> Just kidding. Well, tomorrow. I'm sorry. So so, so. we'll do this all over again tomorrow. Um, very very proud as a council member to have attended our Memorial Day. Uh, it, it was just absolutely fabulous. And every veteran, uh, every uh, family member that I met was thrilled to be in Sugarland. Uh, and I'm sure it's just one of those moments. The second thing I'm very excited about, certainly not on the same level, as the Memorial Day event. Yesterday, we uh, had the opportunity to tour PG Golf. And a lot of people in here are thinking, so what? Well, PG Golf is a fabulous business that is growing rapidly in our community, in our city. I'm so excited to tell you this. And for what it's worth, they recycle 45 million golf balls a year in Sugarland, and I just think it's cool. And it started with two men that are from the Sugarland area, two men uh, working together as buddies, like in their garage, 
and now they're recycling 45 million golf balls a year to the benefit of their business and our community, and I'm thankful for them. Uh, the at-large one district. There we go. That way, William. Great response, brother. There we go. Stuart. <laughs> Thank you, Mayor. First of all, I'd like to... Uh, yeah, I'd like to mention that tomorrow is my birthday, and um, I, I I hope I wish everyone a wonderful my birthday. Uh, I also uh, attended the uh, the golf ball thing last night, and uh, I I took uh, one of the one of the uh, owners aside, and he said that actually um, the mayor accounts for a measurable percentage of those forty five millions that they recycle. And then uh, this morning, uh, I attended, along with Jennifer and Nishad, an interesting and really enjoyable uh, program. And I'd like, I'll, I'll let Jennifer go with that one. Georgia. Yes, we attended the, what, um, what was the name of the Village, Village Living uh, Assisted uh, Living Center um, off of 99? Uh, very, very, very nice facility. Uh, the residents seemed very happy uh, to be living there. Um, I went to um, two HOA meetings, the quarterly HOA meeting here at City Hall and the HOA meeting at Greatwood where staff put on a good uh, presentation about trash services. So I appreciated them coming and answering a lot of questions about that. Uh, we also had the Space Cowboys mural unveiling over at um, First Colony Mall. And just a heads up that the Arc of Fort Bend is having their classic golf tournament on Monday in Weston Lakes. Thank you, Jennifer. Carol. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I attended Commonwealth uh, HOA's annual meeting, and Officer uh, Betseria was uh, one of the guest speakers, and I helped hand out uh, awards for CKW Lexus 2022 Top 20 Impact Makers Awards, and CKW stands for Caring, Kindness, and Wisdom, and among the Sugarland residents who received awards were um, um, Sugarland Legacy President Sonny Sharma and his wife Rajmi. They were named Power Couple for 2022. Sure. Um, just to add on to what Stuart and Jennifer mentioned, the village at Sugarland Assisted Living Care and Memory Center, it's in District 2. <laughs> and it was fun, fun to have breakfast. <laughs> and it's a beautiful at facility. Large district at large district, too. <laughs> uh, beautiful facility. It's only been open for nine months, and uh, they've got 64. There are 107 beds um, already occupied, and, the, and the, the residents really seem happy there. Uh, along with uh, most council this afternoon, um, very happy to see that our eco economic development department worked really hard to get parklet number two um, finally opened up uh, on Kensington Boulevard, once again in District 2. Um, should I say that again, District 2? Um, and if you don't know where, where this parklet is, you know where Blaze Pizza is off of Kensington Boulevard and Target. It's there. Go check it out. It's got beautiful water view and fountains. And so grab yourself a Blaze Pizza or Indian food, I think, and they have Vietnamese food in that shopping center. And when it's not 118 degrees outside, <laughs> go enjoy some food, but they had us out there in blazers that, and I still am sweaty from that from earlier. And then before I went on my whirlwind tour, Mayor, I attended the Telfair HOA and LID 17 update. Um, Telfair and the LID 17 have been trying to work together since uh, the freeze on replacing a lot of the shrubs and trees and others that are just died in the area, and Telfair doesn't look the same, but uh, I want to thank uh, David Gornett um, and Nabila Mansour and uh, the HOA at Telfair. They seem to get have a plan to come together and replace some of the beautiful greenery that is really needed back in my neighborhood, Telfair, in District 2. Thank you. Suzanne. Meanwhile, in District 1, on the 27th, I had the honor and pleasure of watching 12 students from St. Teresa graduate. And it was just a wonderful event to see those kids. They called themselves the 12 disciples because there were 12 students and they did a great job graduating. Such a great event. And on the 28th, the Exchange Club of Sugarland 
held a patriotic concert in Town Square, and if anybody went, it was fantastic. We saw Cookie Joe's dancers dance, and we saw uh, the Fort Bend uh, Boys Choir sang, and it was a great event. So if you were there, thank you for coming and supporting all those different people coming out. And I think that was it. I think it, you guys covered everything else. Thank you. I'm going to highlight tonight Space Cowboys and the great job that staff's done. Uh, last Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, uh, Nancy and I, along with staff, hosted ABM, Traffic Work Cubic, and in Fort Bend ISD. Great attendance by all three groups. Really appreciated the input of staff, and we won all three nights. Now, that's not to say we're not, we're still in the basement. The Astros are in first place, but Space Cowboys are in last, so. Hopefully we'll win a few more games and kind of notch notch up a little bit. I remember B, city city manager report, Mike. No report, Mayor. Motion to adjourn. There we go, Carol. Motion to adjourn at six fifteen. I was I was listening, and all I was hearing was it's Stewart's birthday. <laughs>